on the issue of Medicaid expansion to see if there are um, at least educational pieces we can give them, ways they can look at it, um, clarifying any questions they may have and encouraging Medicaid expansion. Uh, in the issue of the exchanges, what we, and you actually have a bit of an advantage in Pennsylvania in that we have a regional office, but I'll remind folks that we do have 10 regional offices throughout the country. And so with states where we are, um, states are not having a state-based exchange or a partnership, we will be mobilizing our regional staff to work inside each state. We will also be doing series of webinars and educational programs traveling inside the state. And there are several other things we'll be rolling out through the summer to help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Tabner, Thank uh, welcome. Thank you for Thank you. your service and uh, willingness to come up here and answer all these questions today. Um, I, I want a couple things real quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in this, uh, the physician supervision of outpatient therapeutic services in a uh, 2009 Medicare uh, PPS uh, final rule in which CMS issued a, a new policy regarding direct uh, physician supervision of uh, outpatient therapeutic services. And there are a lot of health care organizations that have recognized this as a uh, burdensome and unnecessary policy change, but CMS characterized it as a clarification. And uh, it seems as if CMS uh, retroactively interpreted the policy to require that a physician provide direct uh, super, or physician provide direct supervision instead of general supervision and be physically present in the same outpatient department at all times when uh, outpatient therapeutic services are f furnished. And I'm concerned that the clarification is in fact instead a significant change in Medicare policy that would place considerable burden on hospitals, especially facilities in rural areas. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I know there's a, been a panel uh, convened, but I'm also concerned that that panel uh, is not sufficiently considering the input from rural uh, critical access hospitals. And so I'm wondering if, uh, if you would agree to return to the pre-2009 interpretation of this policy for critical access hospitals. Uh, Senator Thune, I, I appreciate that question. And after we talked yesterday, I thought there were a couple of things that, that we could do. First of all, it, and I think we discussed this with your staff yesterday, uh, adding additional members representing the rural uh, hospitals and critical access hospitals would be helpful so that we make sure we have a balanced dialogue about what direct supervision really means and what's required in these smaller hospitals in remote areas. Um, I will go back and take a look and sit down with your team. I think we've made some progress and so I would want the opportunity to, to sit down with your team and walk through what has been done, but we are certainly willing to look at the original standards and see where we're different. I just, it, it, I, I guess my concern in all this, and I wish I voiced to you yesterday, is that there's not a, uh, a sufficient avenue for rural voices to be heard in this process when the, when the panel is predominantly from non-rural facilities, and so I would appreciate any uh, consideration that you could give no, the input from rural hospitals. And, so. uh, and the other question I wanted to raise with you is uh, I've been hearing from constituents in South Dakota about the impact of uh, preferred pharmacy networks in the, in the Part D program. Uh, for s some seniors, they're not even aware of the preferred network until after open enrollment for Part D. And um, for some seniors, it means the drug plan that they've been using for several years has changed. And those changes Objection. increase. Under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the following nomination, which the clerk will now report. Nomination, the Judiciary, Patty Schwartz of New Jersey to be United States Circuit Judge for the Third Circuit. Under the previous order, there will be 30 minutes of debate equally divided in the usual form. Mr. President, I ask consent to my statement on the nomination of Judge Patty Schwartz of New Jersey to the Third Circuit be included in the records though read. Without objection. And Mr. President, I ask consent to speak on, on my time as on morning business on the legislative matter pending before the Senate. Without objection. Mr. President, four months after the horrific day in Newtown where 20 children, six educators, senselessly murdered, the Senate is poised to make further progress toward the goal of reducing gun violence. That's a goal that all Americans, no matter what your political party, no matter what your philosophy, we should share this. I don't know how any parent 
a grandparent, uh, any relative, ever gets over the horrific disaster in Newtown. Now, I do want to thank our ranking Republican on the Judiciary Committee, Senator Grassley. He worked with us. He supported two of the measures favorably reported by the Judiciary Committee last month, and, and Senator Grassley helped make sure that we had both uh, uh, hearings that were substantive and that we had a schedule so we could vote. I commend Senator Collins, who has been my partner as we move forward with legislation to combat illegal gun trafficking and the straw purchasers who obtain firearms legally but then provide them to criminals and gangs because they make so much money doing that. And we've been joined that bipartisan efforts by Senators Durbin and Gillibrand and Kirk and Klobuchar and Frank and Blumenthal, Shaheen and King. Our bills intend to give law enforcement better and more effective tools. A bipartisan majority of the Judiciary Committee voted for the Stop Illegal Trafficking Firearms Act, S-54. And its provisions including the Safe Community, Safe Schools Act, S-649, that Majority Leader placed, a read placed on the Senate calendar, and which is now moved to proceed. Straw purchasers get around the purpose of the background check system. Straw purchasing of firearms is undertaken for just, undertaken for just one reason. To get, to have somebody who can legally buy a gun, but to get those guns into the hands of somebody who's legally prohibited from having one. We know that many guns used in criminal activities are acquired through straw purchases. It was a straw purchaser who enabled the brutal murders of two brave firefighters in Webster, New York this past Christmas Eve. It was a straw purchaser who provided firearms to an individual who murdered a police officer in Plymouth Township, Pennsylvania last September. Mr. President, is it any wonder the law enforcement across this country say, stop the straw purchasing. We're losing too many brave men and women in law enforcement. Say nothing about all the others killed by drug cartels and criminal cartels. So we need a meaningful solution to this serious problem. We've included suggestions from Senator Gillibrand to go after those who traffic in firearms by wrongfully obtaining two or more firearms. We worked hard to develop effective targeted legislation to help combat a serious problem. And doing it in a way that does no harm to the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding Americans. It was an ATF whistleblower who testified last Congress the existing firearms laws are toothless. We can create better law enforcement tools. That's what we're doing with the Stop Illegal Trafficking in Firearms Act. I urge all senators to join with us and close this dangerous loophole in the law that Mexican drug cartels and gangs and other criminals throughout our country have exploited for too long. And I want to recognize the dedication and leadership of Senator Collins of Maine to confront the issue of gun violence. She's not a member of the Judiciary Committee, but she's been committed to finding common sense solutions to the problems of gun violence. She's been dedicated in working with me to address the concerns of other senators. She and I share a deep respect for the Second Amendment. But we also agree that our laws can be improved to give law enforcement officials the tools they need. And she's been a steadfast partner. Our bill protects Second Amendment rights of lawful gun owners. At the same time, though, it cracks down on criminals and also cracks down the people who assist criminals. It doesn't create a national firearms registry. It doesn't place additional burdens on law-abiding gun owners or purchasers. But it does send a very clear message that those who would buy a gun on behalf of a criminal or a member of a drug cartel or a domestic abuser will be held accountable. That's why law enforcement say, pass this bill. 
Give those of us in law enforcement on the front lines, give us the tools we need. Now, some have expressed frustration about the level of prosecution under existing gun laws. Some have suggested instead of making sensible changes to our public safety laws to prevent gun violence, federal law enforcement officials should focus exclusively on existing laws. Now, I share some of that frustration, but it's not about an excuse to do nothing. Improvements in the enforcement of existing laws, efforts to give law enforcement officials better tools to do their jobs, these are not mutually exclusive. These are efforts that complement each other. A recent article in the Washington Times documented that gun prosecutions were in decline beginning in the Bush administration and suggests having a Senate-confirmed director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives would significantly help law enforcement. And I ask that a copy of the article be included in the record the conclusion of my statement. Without objection. You know, as I said in January, America is looking to us for solutions for action, not sloganeering, demagoguery, partisanship. That's why it's particularly disappointing. Here, some senators are pledging to prevent Senate consideration of these proposals by filibustering. It's especially disappointing to some who claim to support regular order a transparent legislative process, accord that process, no deference. You know, Mr. President, there are only a hundred of us who have the privilege to serve at any given time in this wonderful body. We represent 325 million Americans. How can we talk to those Americans and say, we won't even vote? We won't even vote. We won't let it come to a vote. We don't have the guts to stand up and vote yes or no. We want to vote maybe. Tell that to the families in Newtown, Connecticut. Tell that to the families in Aurora, Colorado. Tell that that the, one, that the people in the United States Senate are not willing to stand up and vote either yes or no. They want to vote maybe. Mr. President. I'm a gun owner. I come from a state with a lot of gun owners. I've got the courage to stand here and vote. I want to vote. Some will agree with my votes. Some will disagree. But this senator feels it's part of his sworn duty to vote. Vote yes. Vote no. But vote. In the Judiciary Committee, we held three public hearings and four public markups on this legislation. We gave them full and fair consideration. We debated and considered amendments. Democrats and Republicans, the distinguished presiding officer is a member of that committee. He knows the debate we had and the votes we held. What a filibuster would do now is obstruct the open process of Senate consideration of gun violence prevention legislation. And it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. It demeans the United States Senate. And it turns our back on 325 million Americans who expect better. So I've worked with Senator Collins and others to provide a real world, common sense solution to the problem of gun trafficking and straw purchasing. Of course, I urge the Senate to take. Let's go forward. Vote. Vote yes. Vote no. But vote. But vote. Have the courage to vote. Don't turn our back on the families who've suffered so much. Mr. President, I ask my full statement to be made part of the record. Without objection. Mr. President, I have eight unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. The approval of the majority and minority leaders, I ask consent these requests be agreed to and be put in the record. Without objection. And I ask unanimous consent that two interns from Senator Rano's office, Chelsea Rabago and Ryan Mandato, be granted privi uh, floor privileges for the remainder of the day. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, I suggest the absolute quorum. And, oh, uh, Mr. President, I, I see the distinguished Senator from Iowa on the floor, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Iowa.
Today, the Senate will consider the 10th judicial nomination this year. With today's expected action, we will have confirmed four district, no, four circuit and six district nominees. At this point in 2005, and that was the beginning of President Bush's second term, comparable to what we're talking about for President Obama, the Senate had confirmed zero judicial nominees. Let me repeat, at this point in 2005, the Senate had confirmed not 10, not four, not even one judicial nominee, so that comes out to be zero. The quick pace of this year comes on top of a very productive 112th Congress in which 111 judges were confirmed. Last Congress, we confirmed more judges than any other Congress going back to 20 years to the 103rd Congress. Despite this progress and our continued cooperation, both with the President and Senate Democrats, we continue to hear unfounded criticism. For example, last week, a White House spokesperson criticized the Senate for what he characterized as arbitrary and unique delays in getting nominees confirmed. In a previous post on its website, the White House complained about unprecedented delays in Senate confirmation process. While acknowledging the Senate had confirmed nine judicial nominees this year, the White House noted that, quote, these nine judges waited 144 days for floor vote compared to President Bush's nominees who waited an average of 34 days for a vote at this point in President Bush's presidency, end of quote from the White House. As I stated at the same point in 2005, none of President Bush's nominees had been confirmed, not one. The purported statistic of the quote-unquote average of 34 days is without foundation. It took until June for President Bush to reach 10 judicial confirmations. President Bush wouldn't have another lower court nomination approved by the Senate until October of that year. But that delay in confirmations wasn't because there weren't nominees. By the beginning of April 2005, 21 judicial nominations had been submitted to the United States Senate. President Bush's first four confirmations came in April 2005. The first two of these nominees were nominated in September 2004 and then consequently confirmed about six months later. The other two nominees waited much longer. Robert Conrad was first nominated April 28, 2003 to the Western District, North Carolina. He was confirmed a full two years later on April the 28th, 2005. Not 34 days, as the White House implies uh, in its website. His colleague, James C. Deaver III, nominated for the Eastern District, North Carolina, waited even longer. He was first nominated May 2002 and waited three years nearly before being confirmed on April the 28th, 2005. So, this notion being expressed by the White House of unprecedented, unique, and arbitrary delays simply ignores the facts and in the process distorts history. In addition to the White House, we hear Senate Democrats grumbling about nominations and calls for changing the rules of the Senate. Of course, if they want to change the rules of the Senate, they'd have to break the rules of the Senate in order to change the rules of the Senate. You know, really, such intemperate comments utterly fail to recognize the work the Senate has already accomplished in approving judges. The purported justification is the number of judges on the counter. That number happens to be 15 right now. Where was there similar concern in April 2004 when the number of nominees on the executive counter was nearly double what it is today? A second prong of this debate concerns the vacancy rate of the federal judiciary. 
blaming judicial vacancies on the Senate confirmation process is unfounded and a distortion of the process. You know, for a very simple common sense rule. The vacancy rate is due not to the Senate not confirming or acting, but the White House hasn't even sent these nominations to the United States Senate. And how can we work on something when we don't even have nominations from the White House and yet people are complaining about it? And here's the statistics. Presently, 62 of the 87 vacancies, or 71 percent of the vacancies, have no nominee up here from the White House. For the 35 vacancies categorized as judicial emergencies, only nine have nominees. Even 74 percent of the judicial emergency vacancies have no nominee. And so to the White House, quit complaining or get the nominees up here and then you got a legitimacy for complaining. So I'd say a few words then about today's nominee. I do have concerns about this nomination which have not been satisfied. Unfortunately, I'm unable to support the nomination, although I expect Judge Schwartz will be approved as U.S. Circuit Judge for the Third Circuit. I congratulate her on her confirmation and hope that she will perform her duties in a skilled manner demonstrating judicial temperament with respect for the law and the Constitution. People need to know then why I'm voting the other way, even though I expect her to be confirmed. This nomination started out troubled, not because of Republican opposition, but because of concerns expressed by home state uh, senators. Uh, originally, Judge Schwartz's home state uh, senator questioned her intellectual fitness for court, stating she, quote, did not adequately demonstrate the breadth of knowledge of constitutional law and pivotal, uh, pivotal Supreme Court decisions, end quote. Concerns were also expressed that she, quote, misapplied the application of strict scrutiny versus rational basis review, end of quote, and then further quote, did not express substantive knowledge as to the scope of the rights of corporations under the Constitution or Jewish prudence on the constitutional limits of executive uh, branch powers, end of quote. According to press reports, she specifically misapplied the law after speaking about Citizens United. That's a court case. There are, uh, to me, these are pretty serious issues. So Judge Schwartz was asked about them during her hearing, specifically discussing the case Citizens United. But she denied it happened, testifying instead that she did not discuss any specific cases, only general principles. However, in follow-up written questions for the record, Judge Schwartz changed her story and said that she and her home state senator had discussed two specific cases, Citizens United and Roe v. Wade. I find this after-the-fact disclosure troubling. Not only was it inconsistent with her hearing testimony, but it prevented me and other senators from following up regarding what discussions she apparently had regarding Citizen United and Roe v. Wade. Because of the ambiguity surrounding these interviews and Judge Schwartz's inconsistent testimony, questions remain as to what understandings were reached and what assurances Judge Schwartz may have given to gain the support of home state senators. Unfortunately, her committee hearing failed to remove the doubts that were initially raised. Again, these were raised by uh, home state senators. Furthermore, because of her lack of candor at her hearing, I was un unable to, to, de to make the determination that she is prepared to be a circuit judge. I share the doubts raised regarding her limited knowledge of constitutional law, misapplication of standards of review, and inadequate understanding of substantive areas of law. Accordingly, I cannot support the nomination uh, but uh, so that the record is complete about her uh, vast background of experience, I'm going to put the rest of the statement in the record 
uh, and uh, this is uh, mostly biographical information. So uh, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from New Jersey. Mr. President, I ask you to have to speak to up to six minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I'm pleased to rise in support of the confirmation of Patty Schwartz uh, to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, a nomination which has finally come to the floor and a time uh, has come to confirm Judge Schwartz. And I express my full support and urge my colleagues to do the same. I'm happy that we were able to work out the vote on this nominee without a cloture vote, which is incredibly important. Uh, I want to refer to my distinguished colleague, uh, uh, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, who mentioned a home state senator, and uh, that happens to be me, uh, and uh, to clarify uh, some issues. I've always taken the role of advice and consent for judicial nominations very seriously, as I'm sure we all do. Appointments to the federal bench are lifetime appointments, and the circuit court is often the last stop before the United States Supreme Court. And that makes that responsibility even greater. Very few Americans, if they appeal, really get past the circuit court and get to a Supreme Court consideration. Uh, we know the process can be long and difficult, uh, sometimes overly partisan on both sides based on legitimate concerns and personal beliefs. But in the end, we always look to confirm the best and most qualified individuals. We conduct a thorough review of the nominees, their understanding of their law, their intellect, their analytical thinking and reasoning. And we make our decisions, and I have made mine about this nominee. I had the opportunity on more than one occasion to discuss with the judge issues that I believe reflect the high standards to which a nominee should always be held. Let me say that there is no understanding between this nominee and myself as to how she would rule in any given set of circumstances. There was a discussion about what the law is today uh, in both uh, those instances. And I'm sure that the judge just simply didn't recall the specifics of that at the time of the hearing, but was forthright in coming back and saying, yeah, there were two cases. The simple discussion of what is Supreme Court decision, it is not, in my mind, is not only appropriate, but at a circuit court level is, is more uh, than desirable. Uh, and in the totality of our discussions, uh, Judge Schwartz indicated to me uh, the type of intellectual rigor, the knowledge that in fact uh, guarantees to me that she deserves the lifetime appointment that uh, I expect the Senate will confirm her to. The fact that I come to the floor today in full support of her confirmation speaks not only to her qualifications but to her character uh, and to her judicial temperament and suitability to serve on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Aristotle said character may be called the most effective means of persuasion. And I can say that having spent time meeting with Judge Schwartz, I'm absolutely persuaded that she is a person of high character and meets the highest standards for any nominee. And I urge my colleagues uh, to confirm this highly qualified woman who I know will serve honorably and serve well. Uh, Judge Patty Schwartz is a proud New Jerseyan. She has been a magistrate judge for the District of New Jersey since 2003. She has a decade, uh, basically, of already clear service as a judge from which we can deduce the type of high standards we expect for a, a judge uh, of the circuit court. Originally from Patterson, she graduated from Rutgers as a Henry Rutgers Scholar with the highest honors. After college, Judge Schwartz went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School edited the Law Review, was named Outstanding Woman Law Graduate. She has been an associate in Philadelphia at Pepper, Hamilton & Sheets, clerked for the Honorable Harold Ackerman of the District Court for the District of New Jersey, and in 1989 joined the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of New Jersey. She rose to the position of Deputy Chief of the Criminal Division and then to Chief of the Criminal Division, serving as the Executive Assistant to the United States Attorney. She's handled over 4,000 civil and criminal cases, and, and since 2009, she has been an adjunct professor at Fordham University School of Law. She's on the advisory board for the Association of the Federal Bar of the State of New Jersey, the Board of Advisors for the Historical Society of the District Court of New Jersey, the Board of Directors of the Federal Magistrate Judges Association, where she represents the Third Circuit. 
She is clearly highly qualified, a woman of distinction who deserves confirmation. If experience, character, and temperament are the most persuasive weapons in a judicial nominee's arsenal, then Judge Schwartz comes before this chamber very well armed. Let me say to my colleagues who may not have had the opportunity to look as closely to this nominee's record as I have, in making my judgment, I had the benefit of invaluable advice and counsel from many members of the federal bar in New Jersey whose opinions I sought. They are both Democrats and Republicans, and they affirmed what I subsequently discovered for myself in discussions with her, that there is not a single reason to vote no on this nomination. I urge my colleagues to send a message through the, the process can be long and fraught with conflicting opinions, but in the end, it bends towards the best and brightest, and Judge Patty Schwartz is proof of it. She has strong bipartisan support, not only from both of uh, the senators from New Jersey, but also our governor, Chris Christie. I urge my colleagues to join me in voting to confirm Judge Patty Schwartz to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, Madam, Pre uh, Madam President. And with that, uh, I yield the floor. Since of a quorum. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The A's and nays are ordered. All time is yielded back. The question is on the Schwartz nomination. The yeas and nays were ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Ayat, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Begich, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cowan, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Fisher, Mr. Flake, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen. Thank you. Aye. Sir. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heinrich. Ms. Heitkamp. Mr. Heller. Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Inhoff. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johans. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Mr. Kane, Mr. King, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Paul, <laughs> Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, maybe, maybe you guys sit Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, gotcha, thanks, Mr. Roberts, 
Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schatz. How'd it go? Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott. Mr. Sessions. Mrs. Shaheen. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Carper, Hagen, Heitkamp, Isaacson, Johans, Kane, Klobuchar, Menendez, Udall of New Mexico, and White House. Senators voting in the negative. Grassley and Inhofe. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo. No. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Merkley. Aye. Mr. Tester. Mr. Tester. Aye. Ms. Warren. Ms. Warren. Aye. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, aye. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. 
Mr. Cowan. Mr. Cowan. Aye. I was here. Coburn. Mr. Coburn, no. Mr. Levin, Mr. Levin, aye. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, aye. Mr. King, Mr. King. Aye. Mr. Roberts, no. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of Colorado, aye. Portman, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, aye. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Vitter, Mr. Vitter, no. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Corker, Mr. Corker, no. Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Donnelly, aye. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, aye. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, 
Aye. Mr. Baucus. Mr. Baucus. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. Mrs. Shaheen. Aye. Mrs. Boxer. Mrs. Boxer. Aye. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow. Aye. Mr. Cornyn. No. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Cruz. No. Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake. No. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Coates. Mr. Coates. No. Mr. Baggage. Mr. Baggage. Aye. Mr. Franken. Mr. Franken. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. No. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Mr. Burr. No. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden. Aye. Mr. Heller. Mr. Heller. No. Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul. No. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven. No. Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray. Aye. Ms. Ayat. Ms. Ayat. Aye. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, no. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Barrasso, no. Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt. No. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune. No. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions. No. Mrs. McCaskill. Mrs. McCaskill. Aye. Ms. Mikulski. Ms. Mikulski. Aye. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson. Aye. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. No. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin. Aye. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby. No.
Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller, aye. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Pryor. Aye. Mr. Pryor. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. No. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Hatch. No. Mr. Kirk. Mr. Kirk. No. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner. Aye. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Harkin. Aye. Ms. Murkowski. Ms. Murkowski. Aye. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Aye. Mr. Risch. No. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman. No. Ms. Landrew. Ms. Landrew. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Feinstein. Aye. Mr. Cochran. Mr. Cochran. No. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Mr. Schumer. Aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, no.
Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell. No. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Chambliss. No. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran. No. Ms. Cantwell. Ms. Cantwell. Aye. Mr. McCain. Mr. McCain. Aye.
Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy. Aye. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or wishing to change their vote? If not, the ayes are 64, the nays 34, and the nomination is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered, made, and laid on the table. The president will be immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate will resume legislative session. Under the previous order, the Senate stands in recess until 2.15.